people look at you and judge you and like and they act like you're literally plagued with something you know like I don't know what it is about me but people can spot me immediately and know that I'm a drug addict and you know you could just like tell the transition that they go from like you know when they think like at first you're a normal person and then like they realize what you are and it's just like you know like a quick downhill slide and it, you know, it, it's painful. Just because I do things to my own body, that doesn't make me a bad person. You know, I just want to be accepted. I came from the mud. There's dirt on my hands. Strong like a tree. There's roots where I stand. There's a disconnect between where our morals intersect with other people's lives. We like to enforce our moral codes and our values onto other people. And if we are going to buy into the myth of what America is for people, then we have to understand that people have to be able to shape their own futures, make their own decisions. Nobody can talk about you or make decisions for you better than you. You know what you need and you know what it's going to take for you to be successful. My name is Dr. Arisha Bowers. I work for National Harm Reduction Coalition and I'm the regional director. I oversee the HEP Connect initiative. <laughs>My name is uh, Arun Skaria. I'm the director for corporate contributions at Gilead Sciences. And what I really work on are our signature programs from Gilead, where we provide funding to nonprofit organizations, really in the spirit of uh, trying to do corporate social responsibility. We looked at CDC data that said that, you know, approximately 360% increases in hepatitis C infections in central Appalachia for young adults. Uh, we also saw almost a tripling of hepatitis C infections in greater Appalachia. We wanted to understand the story behind the data. And what we realized was that we needed to do something more comprehensive to try to make a difference. HEP Connect is a comprehensive strategy where we are trying to do three key things. One, we're trying to improve and increase hepatitis C screening and linkage to care. Uh, we are trying to support harm reduction programming and education. And lastly, also building some healthcare infrastructure in the five states of Greater Appalachia. So that's Kentucky, West Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Indiana. One of the key hallmarks of HEP Connect is our lead grantee partner, the National Harm Reduction Coalition. We've just been blown away by their expertise and strength in managing this initiative and identifying local organizations that can make a meaningful difference. I'm Monique Tula. I'm the executive director of the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Our work over the last 26 years has been to spread the harm reduction gospel, if you will, changing hearts and minds, um, also changing the narrative about the way people view people who use drugs. Harm reduction um, has, you know, is comprised of a bunch of interventions that really deal with the stigma and discrimination. Those Prevention should be an important part of any successful response to confront an epidemic like hepatitis C and the opioid crisis. My name is Kate Gertzen. Um, I'm in Washington, D.C., and I work with NHRC as the Deputy Director of Learning and Engagement. It has impacted me in, in a huge way, both in my work and, and as a person. Um, because I've been able to be in community with these folks who are doing such powerful work. How we connect and how we hold one another, especially in times of challenge or lift one another up in times of joy, to me is the most meaningful. The Help Connect initiative has impacted my work in the sense that I find myself trying to continue to build relationships with individuals that are in you know powerful positions to be able to shift power back to the community. It's one of those things to where you're trying to change hearts and minds. Um, I don't get the luxury of just being able to administer grant funds. I still have to do teaching engagements and speaking engagements to continue to educate folks about what harm reduction is, what the benefits of harm reduction uh, are for different segments of the community. Um, we have had to do a lot of work with um, our law enforcement across those five states and really trying to understand their perceptions around what harm reduction is um, and how we can try to 
forge better relationships where folks have relationships and create relationships where they don't have relationships. Tamika Jackson, I'm the Harm Reduction Resource Manager with the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Being a part of the HEP Connect team, um, the impact of HEP Connect is beyond anything I could actually kind of put into words. HEP Con the HEP Connect initiative is kind of one of the first of its kind. Um, it is a Southern facing initiative where folks have actually seen that there is a need for assistance in um, Appalachia, in the Southern region, right? In these Southern states where sometimes people forget about us in the South. Um, so just having the the actual funds, the money to put into the hands of people that are doing the actual grassroots on the ground work um, is super impactful and more, definitely more than I can actually put into words. It's extremely powerful. I'm Rosa Barber and I'm with Partnership to End A Status Incorporated. Well, the impact that Help Connect has had on my work for myself it has shown a light that I have never seen before. So seeing it now, I can spot it out and I could get people to open up the way they need to, or I could get one of my staff to assist me with opening up to one of these without them feeling like we're being judgmental, without them feeling like other trying to tell me what to do. Listening to the, the veterans in the harm reduction community, you learn something new every day. So it has really made an impact on my life to make me grow up. My name is Mason King and I work at Partnership to NA Status. Currently I am the Hep C recruiter. I also am the artist liaison. I am the Acceleration of Men director and I also do HIV testing and counseling. Hep Connect has a lot of impact on my work. At first, dealing with peas, I was dealing with the LGBTQ community and that's what my main focus was, testing and uh, getting people on their medication and getting people to their appointment. I enjoy that it allows me to help both communities, the heterosexual community as well as the community that I live in. Hello, my name is Jasmine Sasaki. I am the founder and executive director here in Memphis, Tennessee, where we support transgender women of color who use drugs or do sex work. Um, the number one thing Help Connect did was allowed us to um, secure our own building we're able to focus on like our own programs in-house where we don't have to go and find space and have up to like 20 participants here. Uh, Help Connect has also allowed us to continue to do our original program, which was TransPro, which is now three years old. Uh, it allowed us to do TransPro in, uh, in a, in a, in a macro way versus in a micro way, where our stipends were smaller and they're now bigger, where we had an opportunity to serve 10 people, we now can serve 20. Um, where we had only space to bring in two guest teachers or facilitators, we can now bring in four. Um, where we had only small amount of money to budget for flyers, we now have money for logos and we now have money for just that whole digital marketing of the program. So Help Connect has really impacted our work in a way that not only has it changed the trajectory, but it's like put some gas behind us, right? <laughs> like Help Connect has put their foot to the to the the accelerator and really pushed us to do things we didn't know could be done in such early stages of development. I'm Michelle Mathis and I am the co-founder and executive director of the Olive Branch Ministry, a faith-based harm reduction agency located in the Foothills Piedmont area of North Carolina. HEP Connect has enabled us to really think outside the box. Something that we've started with the Help Connect funding, um, and we got the programming funding, so to expand our program itself, is our low barrier Hep C testing. That means that we're able to test people in partnership with the federally qualified healthcare um, agency in our area. Bring people in or go to where they are, carry them their medication once we know that they're positive for Hep C, and actually have folks cured within 60 to 90 days. 
I don't know that there's another syringe exchange in the state of North Carolina that's doing that and very few across the United States. They're doing the, the low barrier hep cure in addition to the testing. We're excited about that because even in the midst of a pandemic, we've still been able to get over 40 people cured. Um, and that is amazing for our little bitty community. And we've pretty much stuck to one county in which we're offering that right now. We'd like to be able to expand and if funding expands, then we'll expand that program as well. But that has been something amazing that HEP, uh, Connect has allowed us to do we wouldn't have been able to do before. My name is Thomas Gooch. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm the prevention director at Streetworks. We do condom distribution, needle exchange, harm reduction, HIV testing, hepatitis C testing, and wraparound services for individuals who's affected with HIV. I think the most important thing about what Hip Connect and the, and the impact that it had on the work and on Streetworks period is that it provided opportunities first. Um, I think that we've employed three different positions uh, with the funding that we got from Hip Connect. Uh, we've been able to buy volumes of supplies that we couldn't buy or uh, purchase before before we got Hip Connect. Uh, and then they, because Hip Connect have these uh, conferences and these meetings now, which switch to Zoom uh, and everything else, is that they allow us connect with other individuals in other cities and other states. So it's to bounce off information, what worked for them, and um, and see if it, it'll, it'll work for us. And if it don't work for us right now, don't mean it won't work for us later on. Because Hip Connect was formed, and then they brought all these different referrals and all this different information, and um, it kind of changed Streetworks as a whole because I've been here for 10 years. Before we started getting this money two years ago, uh, our needle exchange was was real simple. It wasn't too much that we can do, but because they gave us money, they gave us funding, they gave us hope, and then they gave us uh, opportunities. And um, I don't think Streetworks prevention team will be where it was without the Hip Connect grant. My name is Louise Vincent. Um, I work at North Carolina Survivors Union. I am the executive director here in North Carolina. You know, I call it a, a syringe service program or a harm reduction program, but we're really trying to move into calling it um, a drug user health hub. Hep Connect has impacted the work of NCSU exponentially. I mean, it's changed everything. I mean, we went from an organization, I mean, I, We've been, we've been working on pulling things together for about four and a half years. Having a HEP Connect grant, one, just allowed us enough funding to have some staff, right? To, to, to put into place these things that we were dreaming about, right? Low threshold employment. We're able to really provide needs-based supplies, which means we give people what they ask for. We don't limit their supply packages. I mean, so having enough funding, we have a reverse advisory circle. Um, so our, our board is all drug user run, but we have an advisory circle made up of professionals and we treat them exactly the way we treat advisory boards of drug users. We give them no power and we ask them to come. We ask them to come help us. So we have professionals advising us on all the things they should be. They just don't have any power. And I think it's a great way to sort of flip the script. And, um, and it's been working really great. And so these are the kind of things we can put into place when we have time to think about what's working. Um, if you're always running behind the eight ball, if, you, if you're always just behind, it's hard to get ahead. My name is Lil Prosperino. Um, I'm the Southern States Regional Organizer for the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, I do advocacy and movement building work with the HEP Connect grantees as well as other harm reduction organizations in the South, the Midwest, and Appalachia. It is, of course, um, funding for a lot of programs that wouldn't otherwise have it. It's um, more low barrier than a lot of, of grants I've seen. You know, having low barrier funding uh, for several years that can help people get started is just, it's crucial. 
through Hip Connect, we're able to build a long-term movement um, so that this, um, these organizations are sustained even after Hip Connect is over. So my name is Darren Ann Washington and I am the program manager for Sosinto and we run the Recovery GPS program in West Virginia. They have provided so much support, um, even when it comes to making those connections and those partnerships with law enforcement. Um, I'm hoping to use the collaborations that I have gotten through HEP Connect to help improve those relationships in the community and possibly help educate our law enforcement, our community leaders, so that they understand and they see that syringe exchanges are not bad places. My name is Lawson Keppel. I'm with Virginia Harm Reduction Coalition. Uh, we're a harm reduction agency based in Southwest Virginia, and uh, we also do work in Southern West Virginia. HEP Connect has transformed what we've been able to do. Um, up until this point, we had grants that would pay maybe for part-time positions if we had that opportunity. Um, we were limited in the supplies we were able to help folks with. Um, and now we're able to finally, I think, put together a full service operation um, that has hours that, that folks, that where we can meet folks where they're at um, and offer, I, I think, more than just that community building and that public health aspect, be able to deliver, um, you know, that social justice piece where we're shifting those resources that we've been able to get to the community so they can protect themselves. My name is Matthew Brewer. I am the Manager of Prevention and Education for AVOL Kentucky uh, here in Lexington. HEP Connect has, has really helped our program a lot, especially during the last few months. It has allowed us to keep our services going in the time of COVID, which was, we were not expecting at all in regards to when we first got this going. So we are now able to test every single person that walks through our door um, for Hep C. Uh, we've been able to increase our outreach within the community, within Eastern Kentucky as well, and pick up uh, where we where we you know kind of left off with other funding sources and, and increase those services. I'm the executive director of the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition. How Help Connect has helped me with my work. It's helped me to expand my work. Um, it's helped me uh, to have the money to hire, to hire hire people, and um, it helps me to be able to get out into the community a little bit more and explain what we do and why we do it. I am Jess Cochran. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Never Alone Project in Indianapolis, Indiana. The Never Alone Project is Indy's grassroots harm reduction agency. Hep Connect was the first funding that we ever, ever um, got at all. It was the first funding we ever applied for. Um, and here we are, you know, 18, not even 18 months later, uh, in a completely different place, not only as an org, but I think also like a lot of us that have been working on this project through through this process of being funded through Hub Connector in very different places personally and like in relationship to what we're doing with the Never Alone project. Indy Indy's even in a different place. You know, we've we've taken this this kind of initial like little seed money and we've stretched it really, really far. Also, I've always thought that it was really funny that Indiana is like in like this Appalachian Southern States Hep Connect thing. And I know, I know it's because Hep C rates here, right? Like they're huge, but this is not Appalachia. I'm Killian Kinney. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. And I am a licensed social worker and a doctoral candidate. Um, and I am on the board of directors for the Never Alone Project. So the Hep Connect, I think what comes to mind is one word and it's opportunity. What it does is it creates an opportunity for organizations like the Never Alone Project to implement programming in the way that, you know, it needs to happen to actually be effective, to actually meet the needs of the community and help people in a way that feels dignified, that feels caring, you know, um, and that is the future of programming. And so like, this is an opportunity for us to actually do that. And so we are really appreciative of that. And uh, I think we need to have more opportunities like this. This needs to grow. So this is a great opportunity. Hi, my name is Tammy Morris, and I am the executive director of the Aliveness Project of Northwest Indiana, where hope begins. It has allowed us to 
move the pendulum from just being an HIV um, care center to now a really multi-level social service agency. And it's just um, allowed us to expand our services to the people that walk through our door or who are referred to our agency. And as far as presentations are concerned, it's also allowed us to get into more doors. And now once we're in, that's it. It's, it's on and popping. We, <laughs> you're calling us back because the uh, audience, that we, the people that we're talking to, they're starving for information. My name is Deborah Stanley, and I am the founder and executive director of Imani Unidad. Uh, and it's a not-for-profit here in South Bend, Indiana. And I do whatever it takes to uh, keep this organization alive and thriving. When I first met the Help Connect people, I, we were in Kentucky, I believe. But anyway, so I, I just remember this as the most impactful part. And on my evaluation when I left, what I put on there was that was the most humanizing experience I had ever had. So, you know, and it's, 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 it, it, it made me feel so much better about who we are, you know, because that is exactly what we consider ourselves what we value in, in what we give to community. And so to go somewhere and be able to feel that for myself, it was it was just wonderful. I'm sure you know in in the business world, it's easier to get a job if you have a job. It's easier to get money if you have money <laughs> sort of thing. And so the the ability that the fact that they trusted us to do the work and, and, and provided the, the funds to us up front. That, that said a whole lot. Uh, and it also positioned us on paper uh, to other funders, you know. So, so that was good. And I've heard that from uh, a lot of uh, my compadres as well. They provided technical assistance to us, uh, questions that we've had. They, they, uh, provided a place for us to network because for most of us, this work that we do is not sanctioned by by legislatures or society or anything like that. And so it's just a way for us to have comrades in the struggle. Um, that's been wonderful. The, the, the ability for us to advise one another has been wonderful. Uh, yeah, and, and just validation for the work that we do, you know, honoring and saying that it, it has value uh, and, and, and somewhere somebody appreciates this. Uh, and, and again, just to have been provided the means to do even more uh, that we was we were already doing you know out of our own pockets uh you know begging here begging there you know um and 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 kind of just kibble and bitten along but to be able to now really have a flourishing project that thrives uh, yeah and really truly even serves the community even better our team is really excited to, to work with grantees on where they say they need support or um, what we discover together might be helpful. But I think what's even more meaningful is the long-term connections um, that we're building with folks as you know a member of the broader movement and that we're supporting folks to build with one another. The best thing about being a part of the Help Connect initiative is the grantees. Our grantees are a group of very colorful people. <laughs> you know, they do amazing work around harm reduction services, but they're also just very cool people to know. You know, I think one of the most fun things about this is talking to them about just regular stuff that's going on. We have a lot of different aspects of people's lives that come along with them. And so, yes, we celebrate the harm reduction work that they do, but we also get to meet some really great people along the way.
being involved with the Hub Connect initiative so far has been um, the convening uh, earlier in the spring, seeing programs um, buying together at the beginning of COVID when we were really unsure about what was going on, and also seeing program solution um, build together and work in interactive ways to uh, make harm reduction stronger and more productive um, throughout the Hub Connect region has really been my favorite part. The best thing about the Hub Connect initiative, it's been lifting up the work of harm reductionists who are directly impacted people, who are people with lived experience of substance use, of sex work, uh, who are Black folks working to bring harm reduction to Black and Brown communities. My name is Tiffany Sevier, and I was hired as a consultant um, to work with uh, law enforcement engagement with our grantees. Kind of had this heated discussion and uh, myself and Dr. Bowers came up with the idea of we need to see about getting some dialogue between the grantees and law enforcement or drug users and law enforcement. Well, I feel like they should be supported. Um, I feel like, it, it, I mean, you have to have boundaries, but I feel like this is an ongoing problem uh, that's probably not going to end anytime soon. So the funds, you know, we need to support them. Just doing my part of being able to help them do their work is extremely satisfying. It, it definitely feels really good to be able to be a part of the initiative and be on the part where we're actually helping folks help folks. The best thing about being a part of Hep Connect is being a part of something that is progressive and something that's non-traditional or shows up in a way like among health experts and community experts and health department workers. Um, although Help Connect is not the most traditional in, in in like how you all do the work, you all still have like those traditional relationships that are needed to support our work, right? Um, and also to get us to places where we're not normally at and invite us to spaces we're not normally invited to. So I think that's the best part about being a part of Help Connect the best thing to me is offering the extra layer of support and just the education that has been offered. Um, being able to reach out to the coalition and to um, everyone who's involved and they're open and available always. Anytime I reach out and have a question, they always are is there to answer. And it's not always that you have that privilege. The best part of being about the Help Connect initiative is definitely working in a different community than my own. It's also allowing me to see that everyone needs help. Everyone needs someone, no matter your sexuality, race, gender, it doesn't matter. I love that now people in the community know me, not just for testing my community, but also helping people get off drugs and um, understand what harm reduction really means. The best part about being uh, part of the HEP Connect initiative is partnering with like-minded people who have the same goals that you do and maybe do their programming different. So we're able to bounce ideas off of each other. It's a whole family, a whole network of people that are working in harm reduction, trying to reduce the negative consequences of these high-risk behaviors. And we all approach it differently. But through HEP Connect, we're able to network more closely and able to have that idea exchange that allows us to you know, tweak our programs, maybe not recreate the wheel totally and um, try new things. And if it doesn't work, then you know, we can go back to the drawing board or, or try something from another program. But it's just linked people together who were doing the work in a different type of way to where we're able to share ideas better. Well, I think the best thing about being part of the HEP Connect initiative is just being connected to all of these other groups that are community-led trying to do the same thing. I mean, it just gives you community partners um, and, and a great organization like National Harm Reduction Coalition that wants to provide capa you know, capacity building and support. The HEP Connect initiative is, you know, it's like really collaborative. We have a great team. Um, we all have our strengths and I think we rely on each other for those so it, it just works out really well.
Hi, my name is Joe Agoda, and I'm the CEO of Sustento. We are a 501c3 nonprofit uh, that views ourselves as the nonprofit consultancy for the frontline health worker. The network that Hep Connect brings together is really amazing. To sometimes when you're doing this work, you feel alone and you wonder if there are other folks who are out there working on the same problem. So uh, the Hep Connect network has been really great um, having peers who are doing similar work uh, across Appalachia and hearing what they're doing and the struggles that they go through make you feel that you're not alone. And I think the best part of the HEP Connect program has been able to hear and see other groups that are working in the same space as us. Um, so, Because when you know you're not alone, it feels like you can go further. Being part of the HEP Connect community opens us up to um, a network of folks that we might not have had otherwise. Um, it has opened us to resources and training. Um, it has helped us be a better organization um, when it comes to hepatitis C care in the testing and making sure that we get folks engaged in care if that's something they choose. I think the best for me, it's like we have these, we have these meetings, <laughs> these Zoom meetings um, every, every, every two weeks, every week. There's one going on now that I, I called him and told him I couldn't do it because I was doing this and it's on safe injection. And we have these meetings and we're able to talk to people from other areas of the country that got Hep Connect money and how they're, how it's, how they're working with it, what they're doing with what they've done with it, and how the community uh, accepts their program even more so now because they're able to do more. There's a couple of pieces to that, right? Like for us as like a new org, um, not only was there like that booster seed money, but there's been this ability to connect with folks that like, I don't know, I've never been the ED of anything, right? Like I'm over here classically trained to like run stats. It's been really nice, I think, not just for me, but also for some of our volunteers and staff to be able to pose questions to folks that are also further along in what they're doing. It's kind of put our program and like me and, and our outreach coordinator in positions where like people call and check in and say like, hey, what's this thing, Yeller? It, it's, it's been an interesting little like shove into some sort of community of folks that are trying to figure out how to do do the damn thing. This group was something else. I mean, I, it's black, white, male, female, all kinds. And again, through the, through, through the virtual um, Zoom um, meetings that we have, we're really getting some insight on how some of the other states operate and what, what they have done to be, become more successful with their program. And that has meant the world to, to me personally, because again, I felt kind of alone out here trying to do this, pro, trying to do this work, but now I found finding out that I got some, some new partners all throughout the United States, and I wouldn't have never had that experience to be able to provide, to get that insight to provide better programs for my community if it had not been through the Hep Connect initiative. So the best part of being part of the HEP Connect family <laughs> is just that, the whole camaraderie, the connection to others doing the same sort of work, the value of the experiences of one another and being able to share that, you know. So I'm, I'm pretty much like an elder in the game now. And so, uh, I always tell young people that's the only reason we gray-haired people stay around is to share our knowledge and our experiences with the younger folks, you know. And so, yeah, to be able to do that and, and even having connected me to people in my own state, you know. We can't solve a problem with the same level of consciousness that gave rise to it in the first place. And so the level of consciousness that created these racialized drug policies is the thing that needs to change. It's not just the policies, but it's the people who enact them, and it's the quality of our interactions that also need to change. 
And the way that that happens is to recognize that we are all interconnected. So we have to be deploying every resource that we have uh, in our toolkit, shall we say. Um, everything that we know, you know, that works to prevent overdose and HIV and Hep C, but also to, you know, promote, um, you know, to help people find a little, little bit of dignity, um, you know, in their lives, a little bit of respect. Um, that is really the essence of harm reduction. It requires that I pause before I respond to a challenging situation and ask myself, what is the most loving thing that I can do in this moment? My dream for the harm reduction movement right now, I've, I've been thinking a lot about connection and, and what it has meant to define in this difficult year when we've been forced apart from one another, from, from in-person gathering, um, to find that connection and find ways to lean on one another um, and prioritize those spaces, even if they don't have specific outcomes <laughs> assigned to them, as critical to how we grow, to how we uh, find strength as human beings, and how we build new ways of working that we haven't thought of before. My biggest hope for the harm reduction movement is that people who are in, engrossed in this work, who are immersed in this work are able to get the resources that they need to continue to do the work. You know, Hip Connect is an initiative, but it's not indefinite. Like we don't know if this is going to last, how long this is going to last. We hope that it will last for years to come. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is this is one of the largest uh, financial commitments that has ever been given to harm reduction work. Uh, over its in existence. My hope is that people will see the value in, in what we're doing, um, see the value in the work of our grantees and the ways that they're impacting the communities that they serve um, and get behind them and support them in their work. Another hope that I have is that we'll see more um, organizations come out of the shadows and be out there. That's a good fit for some people, but for, stain for sustainability purposes, I don't know how sustainable organizations can be without having the freedom to just be, to just exist, to just do what it is that they do. And so that's a hope for me, is that folks are able, that we can create the kind of climate where folks can just do the work that they need to do and not feel the need to have to keep it a secret because of the stigma or because they're afraid they're gonna end up in jail or what have you. Um, this is helping people and people just need to have the flexibility to be able to exist and do their work. My name is Roxanne Saussier. I am a consultant and I work with the National Harm Reduction Coalition on their Hep Connect project. I'm based here in Raleigh. Um, and with them, I'm working with groups providing technical assistance and capacity building especially around organizational development. My hopes and dreams for the harm reduction movement are about embracing our ideals of making it a movement that is led by people who use drugs for people who use drugs. And then also my other hopes for the harm reduction movement would be that we can um, reach out to other allied movements a little bit more. I'm thinking of movements like the movement for reproductive justice or um, you know, movements for racial justice, criminal justice reform. Um, movements to dismantle the family regulation system because we really have a lot in common with those movements. Um, you know, we're all trying to get out of st structures that harm us and rebuild something new, rebuild, um, you know, a new structure that serves us well. I really want to see the harm reduction movement embrace the leadership and um, tradition of um, people with lived experience that have been doing this work for generations and embrace the leadership and experience of people who use drugs and trans folks and people in the sex trades. Um, I think that when harm reduction really embraces those traditions and um, creates new paths, uh, we'll have a movement that feels spacious enough for the world that we want to build. Some of my hopes and dreams, I just want 
our grantees, and not just grantees, but staff personnel, um, whoever's involved. I My hope is to be able to touch each and every one of them in some kind of way where we can all learn to sustain uh, what we're starting, um, to be able to carry on uh, after or if, you know, this goes away or if, you know, you, you don't want to be a part of harm reduction anymore. I just hope that and pray that uh, the organizations and, and personnel involved would still be able to be successful from what they've learned and knowledge that, you know, that they've gained from being a part of this uh, big team. I hope that we continue the Southern Facing work. I hope that the harm reduction movement continues to see um, the value in Southern facing and Southern centered work. Um, we know that the National Harm Reduction has um, its feet all over the nation, um, but the South needs its moment also, right? We need a little extra loving on over here. So that's my hope is that we continue um, some Southern facing, Southern centered work. It's my hope and dream that the harm reduction movement can actually continue to bring color to the movement. There's so many people of color who suffer from overdose, who do not feel supported by their family and friends throughout their journeys of usage. And, and also it's my dream that we bring the awareness that safe sex practices are a part of harm reduction as well. And how can we bring these messages about saving lives to communities of color? Because the struggle and the trauma already exists the plague is already in the communities of color. So now it's just time for us to bring along those specific messages that only communities of color can craft because it takes us to talk to us. So I think that's what I'm most excited. We're able to get this new generation to pay attention to their habits, to pay attention to their safety, to actually care. The, the stats have lowered. We are seeing more people survive from overdose because they're not all intentional. We are seeing people seek help. Um, although they're not stopping, we are seeing people be able to acknowledge that they need help or to acknowledge that they need safe ways. In due time, by us helping one another, it will, it will cease one day. That's my, that's my dream. If I have one hope and dream for harm reduction, it's eventually that we all work ourselves out of a job. That drugs are decriminalized, that there is more an increase in mental health, brain health funding for folks that want it, and for folks that aren't at that step or it's something they're not interested in, that we're able to reduce stigma and shame and get rid of the war on drugs um, to the point that people can just be who they are and seek services from providers and live their lives in a way that gives them true freedom. We don't have that now. Harm reduction still, even though it's legalized in many states, the work that we do, it's still so underground just simply because of the shame. So I hope that we work ourselves out of a job and I hope that we eliminate st uh, shame and stigma that goes along with that. My hopes and dreams for the harm reduction movement uh, probably first and foremost is that the funding continue, that we find uh, ways or faster ways to get people into treatment when they're ready, when they're treatment ready individuals like me and other individuals to have a voice for the people until they can be able to speak up for themselves. Maybe to, to the point to where, you know, you see what harm reduction is and like you put them in the in, in on the on bus stops and bus shelters and and you just put this information in other places it's on billboards as opposed to try to hide uh this epidemic like because this like addiction is an epidemic that should be in the forefront out front so people know that there's help available i have to believe that this movement is special you know this is the movement that when my daughter dropped when my daughter died 
I had family and I was connected. Um, this was the, this is the movement where my friends are, the people I love, the people who, who do this work with me. Um, just so many, so many special people sort of involved in this movement and doing this work. And um, yeah, I think it's great. I think it's really great. I would like to see harm reduction everywhere, you know, yesterday <laughs> and invested in. Um, there's no reason to treat people as lesser than because they use drugs. In West Virginia specifically, um, this is a complicated place where um, I don't think the larger public opinion of harm reduction is negative. But there are some really loud naysayers, I guess. Unfortunately, a small group of really loud people who have a really fascist mentality towards people who use drugs, you know, they, um, they mock people who use drugs, they mock people who live in tents or live outside. Um, you know, these people are already dealing with like police harassment and incarceration. And then aside from that, they have people in the community, you know, trying to tear them down. Like we can't just do harm reduction. We also have to confront that kind of stuff. So our greatest hope is that we can continue to grow our program so that we can take it from what started in one rural West Virginia County and grow it to a statewide program. and. We would hope that through the work that we would do, we could prove that people do recover, that they go on to lead productive lives, uh, and that we can reduce stigma around this crisis. Because I think only by elevating the individuals who um, are doing the important work, that are doing the harm reduction work, that are doing the peer counseling work, and then also highlighting the stories of the people with lived experience and what they're doing uh, is our, most uh, and best path to, uh, you know, turning back a crisis that right now is getting worse due to COVID-19. Um, so my greatest hope will be to prove the power of people who care, who are willing to treat uh, individuals and build relationships with them rather than just trying to um, look at them as a problem that needs to be solved. My hope for all of this is that we get to a place where, as a culture um, beyond harm reduction, that we recognize the value of life, regardless of pathology, um, that people have value, um, that people aren't disposable in our community, and that we're all in this together. Um, and, you know, we've got to find a way. Um, to empower each other and protect each other and help each other. My hopes and dreams for the harm reduction movement is that people let us do our job without stigma, without harassment, and that people are willing to sit down and listen to what we have to say about how harm reduction can make not only their city safer, the streets cleaner, and make, the, make their whole area a better place because we under, they understand what's going on with the people who use. The, the reason that it works here is, is because we've taken that space that was given and we've created a way for those of us that never get asked. Those of us who are doing this work and, and our participants because we're co-creating all of this, right, with feedback from them, have an ability to create something that that does work it does it, it it's capable of shifting that power to us to our folks to our participants to people that use drugs here to people living with hiv to people living outside to people living with hep c right to people who don't have insurance who are paying like all this fucking money for their insulin like come see us i got you we will figure that shit out right people that don't have narcan um and that's, that's what I would love to see the movement go back to. 
I hope it stays, um, it stays alive. Um, I'm going to do my part to make sure that it stays alive. I'm getting involved more with, with the groups who've already started and just piggyback right off of them. Create, create and um, develop a new team of community workers and begin to address some of the, the issues that we have been in denial about. The hopes and dreams that I have that one day politicians, legislators will listen to the medical community, the frontline workers and create legislation based on what we determine it needs to be. You know, how do we prioritize being together in person once we finally can? And I hope we're able to give ourselves that moment to just be together, um, to, to collect, to think about what we learned, to, to not always assign um, a lofty outcome to our time together, but to value just the time and the togetherness. I have a dream team. Um, I'm very proud of my team. I think that they do excellent work in terms of supporting the grantees that they support. Um, my hope, my biggest hope for them is that they're able to um, lean into a sense of incompletion uh, because there's always more work um, than there is time and resources to do the work. And so um, we won't get everything done that needs to be done. My biggest hope for, for us as a team is that we're able to connect folks with resources within their own community um, and make those um, trade-offs and warm handoffs um, in a way that allows them to continue those relationships um, on and on throughout the years. Um, the biggest thing for me with my team and our, our pending success is that we're able to forge those relationships that grantees will need that'll be able to sustain them throughout time. My hopes and dreams for the communications department at NHRC are that um, we will build capacity and be able to work with Hep Connect grantees and programs to build out campaigns that are as big as their dreams. So one of the things that comes with more communications capacity is the ability to do like design work and really visionary things that speak to our community. And we know that art and um, design moves us to action. And so building out capacity on the communication team so that we can better support Hep Connect grantees in the future is a huge priority and hope of mine. My hopes and dreams for We Care Tennessee are just that we can continue to do the work that we do in the way that we do it, but that we can find funding to make sure that we can continue to do this work until we are no longer needed. My hopes and dreams for peace is to, like I said, we just joined in a fight together. We continue educating. Um, for one day for peace to be a part of the change, um, for peace to be a part of the initiative, for those who speak about peace to say peace made a difference. They care. They gave us an opportunity when no one else would. They listened. They gave us a hand. They held our hand. They was there from beginning to end, from A to Z. They never judged us to try to provide a clinic so we can also do all kind of wraparound services for an individual who come in that is addicted. I probably think more so it'd be as a referral center, like open up a whole nother space and, uh, uh, and we provide like uh, computer classes and you know, just a full wraparound service for an individual. So an individual come in here hopeless, but when they leave from here, they think about the world totally different. Or they think about it how they used to think about it before they got addicted to whatever they was, what they're addicted to. So that's kind of like what I hope and, and believe street works will be in the future. It's hard to imagine not being underground at least being able to operate more openly and without fear of persecution. Um, at least, you know, to have access to funding and um, supplies, maybe to um, be able to link people to other types of care, like 
medication assisted treatment or um, you know having a more formal way to take people to their appointments um, their doctor's appointments in Charleston to um, treat hepatitis C or whatever to help queer people get on PrEP you know just um, being able to operate under less scrutiny so that we can connect people to other forms of care. You know, the vision um, that I have um, for Virginia Harm Reduction Coalition is to own the drug user health space, um, to provide a space um, that allows access to care for folks who wouldn't necessarily engage in it otherwise, um, to move care outside of a clinical environment to a place where people feel comfortable. So, you know, the vision that we have as a board and that I have as, you know, for myself is that we're able to continue to reach folks and allow them access to the things they've been denied. One thing that I would like to do eventually is hopefully uh, become like a full S a clinic that includes uh, full STIs, uh, possibly HIV treatment. Um, prep clinic, um, but also maintaining the, the, um, the original aspect of, of, of what AVOL is, an outreach organization. That uh, we continue to grow, that we continue to serve based on uh, our, our spiritual connection to community, uh, and that we continue to find folks who believe in service, in humanity. And, and I hope that we never ever in, in get to the place where our business is staying in business. You know, we never get that big, that we just stay committed and, and keep our nose to the grindstone. Three things that I would like to share with the world about harm reduction in the Southern region. One is that black people do harm reduction. <laughs> it's not a myth. Uh, black folks do harm reduction um, and we do it pretty well <laughs> um, and have been doing it for quite some time. Um, I would say we do it different. <laughs> we do harm reduction very different than other places in the world. And right, there's no other place like the South anyway. <laughs> so we gotta be different. Um, and I would say also, not only, not only do we do it, we do it different, but we do it with that Southern charm that you can only find here um, with a slice of hospitality on the side. Uh, but I do think that there are some gems um, in the South. In the South, we have um, one grantee that is, um, it is led by a person of transgender experience. Um, and they are, you know, growing by leaps and bounds as we speak. But um, I think the great thing about them is that they're working across movements to do transformative justice, to do you know gender justice, to do um, harm reduction, and a lot of other work. Speaking on it from from the standpoint of a southern um, lens, you know we're able to tap into the faith-based community. We're able to tap into um, a lot of other spots in the community that. Um, haven't necessarily been a part of the harm reduction movement. And I think that's one of the greatest, greatest gifts um, that we can add as the South. It's something to see church folks um, doing harm reduction. So we have a long tradition of harm reduction in the South. And in Appalachia and particularly in black communities too, there's also a long tradition of mutual aid. Um, of communities coming together to provide care, food, um, other kinds of support. I think about the, the social aid and pleasure clubs in New Orleans that grew out of benevolent aid societies. And so those were groups where um, when black people couldn't get insurance at the time, they came together and so people could pay a small amount of dues and then they could, you know, if somebody was sick, they could get support or if they needed help burying a family member, 
they could get support for that. And so those grew into the social aid and pleasure clubs that you know put on second line parades in New Orleans and um, with brass bands and it's so so much more vibrant than you know your regular insurance company. So I think of those roots, um, and that's kind of the history that harm reduction grows out of in the South. And so it might look a little different than some other places, but it's authentic. My other um, thing that I would want people to know about harm reduction in the South is that we're really severely underinvested in. Um, the South in general, social change movements in the South, there's underinvestment. I think I've heard a statistic that for something like every dollar that is spent nationally on social change, um, an average of 56 cents is spent in the South. And so at the same time, we're the part of the country where the civil rights movement has grown out of. There's a saying, as the South goes, so goes the nation. And I think that that's still true. Um, and it's great that Hub Connect is investing in, in Southern Appalachia. And I would encourage other groups to invest here as well. Everyday folks have mobilized really impressive like responses to keep their communities safe. They have mobilized underground exchanges and um, you know mobile work out of the back of their car um, and that sort of thing. And some of them have um, you know really grown their programs to be. Um, part of the local infrastructure even. So I love that um, PEP Connect is really like investing in those types of strategies that are really of the community, by the community, for the community. The harm reduction work being done in the Southern region is some of the most har impressive harm reduction work that I have ever, I've, I've ever seen done. I think harm reductionists working not just in the South, but in, in any rural environment are some of the, the bravest and most dedicated people that I've met and are also just incredibly smart and very, very compassionate people. We're here. <laughs> uh, we are in a place of um, growth but also in a place of need. And we need folks that are willing to do the work to be with us doing the work. We need everyone. We need folks um, that identify um, as a person who uses drugs. And we need folks who have skills that they can bring to this movement to continue to push it forward so that we can help folks. Um, we do know that stigma, shame, and bias um, kills people. So in order to shake that and change that, we need everyone. We need everyone. Um, the folks that may feel as though they aren't a part, you are still a part because you're a part of the community. Um, and harm reduction is for everyone and everything. We are trying to make sure we give folks the opportunity to live their best life um, the way they choose to live their best life. And so that is something that I think transcends to everything. What I want the world to know about harm reduction in the Southern region is that it's really needed. There are a lot of people in the South who suffer from overdose. Something as simple as Narcan training can really make a difference in the South. I would like for the people in the South to open their horizons and know that these conversations, nothing else but help our community. We don't have to fear conversations about drug use, just like we don't have to fear drug use, right? This is something that is that is going on in many communities, and it's something that we can say that we support our community. We don't need to lose any more lives. Those. We don't need to lose any more family and friends to stigma and shame. It's time for the South to step up. It's time for us to include harm reduction in our everyday lives and practice. Everyone who has a habit of drug usage is not a criminal. They're not a bad person. Um, I would like to share that everyone needs help, whether um, it's a doctor, whether they're a nurse, whether they're, they work at Walmart. Everyone deserves the same amount of respect when you're helping them, no one should feel that they can't come to you for help because they're afraid of the backlash that they will receive. Well, I would like to see Southerners change about 
anything that we are battling, I would like to see people be more accepting and I would like to see people be more um, comforting where anyone could come and speak to you about anything, no matter what it is, no matter the time of the day, no matter the day of the week. In the South, I would love to see a stronger faith and harm reduction connection. I would love to see faith leaders, not just Christians, but Muslims and Jews and everybody in between, and even people of non-theological faith, uh, humanists and atheists. I'd love to see us all be able to embrace harm reduction for what it is, which is basically the golden rule, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Simple as, simple as that. We want people to live the healthiest life they can for as long as they can and do as much good as they can. And if we're able to assist people in their journey to do that, to take that next positive step in the South, we should say we're fixing to do it and then we need to do it. So for me, faith and harm reduction in the South, it's all one big happy family. What we need to do is get the message and get more people of faith on board so that we can reach more people in our own communities. First and foremost, you would have to take your personal bias out the way. You can't even think of this in, in ways that you've always thought about it. Like uh, addiction is not going nowhere, um, but there's a lot of other things that we can do to assist the individual when they when they in a space that they don't want to be in what we condone is hope what we trying to give to somebody is life and when you give an individual narcan when you give an individual clean syringes when you in, you give an individual a glass tube you're not condoning bad behavior what you're trying to do is be pro life because one of the things that the executive director old executive director told me when when he was here is that you can't save a dead addict I'm promote life and and somebody has to do this the same way somebody has to be the president somebody has to be the CEO of this agency somebody else has somebody has to do that because I couldn't even imagine if we didn't have no agencies doing this the, the one thing I want people to know about harm reduction in the south is that we are gonna get there we have good people that are fighting this fight and we are going to demand change, that this is not going to be okay to continue to deny people access to sterile supplies, to deny people access to treatment, to deny people access to the truth, to evidence-based interventions. Um, we are watching, we are growing, and we are um, organizing, and we're not going to let it happen. You know, we are not going to sit back while, while people destroy it um what we have left you know and there's a lot of people that are really tired and they're tired of watching their friends die their families die there'll be a lack of evidence-based interventions it's just it's just wrong in the southern region we have a lot of barriers that prevent us from starting um, harm reduction clinics or harm reduction outreach services um, the number one of those is stigma and we honestly believe that with the proper education, data, and supplies that we will be able to bring carbon reduction into Southern. It is important to know that the Southern region in regards to harm reduction was we are, we are very much moving forward and we are making lots and lots of progress in terms of uh, the knowledge uh, in terms of the resources available to our community, to the people, to, our, to the most vulnerable of our community, um, and that we're going to catch up at some point and maybe lead the way. There are agencies in the South that are doing harm reduction work that are being run by folks that know exactly what they're doing because they're people with lived experience who folks should definitely be paying attention to.
I really um, work within the harm reduction uh, movement as well as within the organization to form relationships that are accountable enough to hear feedback um, when we're not having equitable practices and when someone wants to speak up. Um, and so I like to both model that and um, be the recipient of it when working with programs and um, yeah, so we just really are working to um, address racial equity through mutual accountability and creating transformative systems that allow us to, um, to you know, hold that we can be harmed and also can cause harm. It doesn't necessarily just happen on its own. It's definitely something that we've put a lot of intention into. It was important to us to fund organizations led not just by people who use drugs, but by people of color um, and to fund organizations that were serving people of color. We know that in the harm reduction movement itself, that um, race is a huge, huge, huge component in one of the things that has uh, become a barrier for folks. Um, if it is um, racialized drug policies, if it's um, inequities in the justice system um, for folks of color, that affects our ability to do work. Um, and it also affects everyone's ability to continue to do work if we don't have the conversation about the things that have gotten us here. Um, the reason that folks have been locked up Right, the reason that folks are locked up for years for drug use, um, it or, or uh, having paraphernalia or, or anything like that, that that becomes the conversation um, because it's a part of the world, it's a part of the system, the system that is created. So race is one of those things that we have to center, just like us talking about um, the nuanced or specialized experience of folks in the South specifically. So it's a part of the human experience um, and it is different from any other experience. Um, that's what we've seen so far. Um, as a part of the Help Connect initiative, uh, we bring, Dr. O has made it a point to make sure that um, our team makes it a part of grantees conversations. Well, what is the race equity conversation that you are having with your staff? Um, what is the race equity conversation you're having with the folks that you work with? Um, how does race show up in your work? So we ask those questions all the time so people have a clear understanding that um, the HEP Connect team is very, very, very well aware of how important race equity is, how important that conversation is to the movement. Having close relationships um, allows me to do anti-racist work in the community in a way that doesn't feel, you know, performative or um, it just comes from a genuine place because these are people that know me, that care about me and I care about them. It's just easier to talk about those kinds of things and um, it's easier to talk about how, you know, everybody's welcome at our program and there are just certain norms that, you know, we expect people to follow, um, you know, that aren't harming other people that, you know, aren't racist, aren't homophobic or transphobic or, you know, that respect women, you know. Um, so I think um, I'm able to have hard and uncomfortable conversations with people easily. When it comes to um, health equity and, and racial justice, uh, you know, it's so important that we meet each other where they are, we listen to each other, that we understand that there are structures that have put people at disadvantage for generations. And we, I think we need to recognize and respect that and use that as a starting point, you know, in our conversations and in our collaborations. We make sure that our organization looks like the folks that we're serving. So that it means hiring and empowering people of color um, because, you know, people are just, you know, if, if the service delivery reflects 
me as a community member are more apt to be a part of that. So we do it through that. Um, we are working as an organization on anti-racist training um, within us, within what we're doing in our service delivery. Um, we're also working on board expansion to make sure that those voices uh, are heard in our, and drive our organization. When I'm looking at racial equities and, and, and diversity, is like I'm looking for people who have a sense of what harm reduction is. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would like to hire people who are in recovery or, or still using, you know, who have their stuff together enough to be able to come in and, and do and work. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at uh, trying to make, uh, make it more diverse. I'm looking for a woman to do the surrender change also. So we have to, we have to look at equ uh, racial equity and diversity. Um, I have to look at it very closely. And I have to really get out and try to find the people that really want to do the work. And it's, and it's not easy. Indianapolis uh, is not a white city. Indianapolis has never been a white city. Like this is like, Indianapolis is like if Atlanta was situated in like part of Chicago. Like it's, it's vibrant and it's full of like black, powerful history. So, you know, of course, one of the ways that we try to be responsive and like work um, with values uh, that include racial equity is making sure that the voices they were paying attention to when we're doing program planning are voices from black and brown communities. Um, that's something that we're really intentionally crafting our board. The success that we've seen with the Never Alone project is really because it's community-led. It's because it's built into uh, so many different pieces of Indianapolis and like social networks and drug user culture networks and so many like, hey, I know this person that knows this person that does a thing. It would humble me and honor all of us for people to, to know that that is what this is, that this is a testament to doing things with a mind to mutual aid and to, to creating equity in our communities. We just want to give my, the, the team, the Hep Connect team, uh, a huge shout out because I think what they are co-creating with the Hep Connect grantees is nothing shy of, you know, miraculous. And, you know, some people may say that that's an overstatement, but the fact that we have people in parts of the country that have such a disdain for harm reduction, you know, who are actually beginning to embrace it now. I just been so pleased at the HEP Connect grantees and the hard work that they're doing on the ground, both during COVID time, but even before COVID time. And we're just grateful to be part of the harm reduction movement. And I know that they're really making a difference and we appreciate all their hard work.